Good morning. And again, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, you know, we've, he been, we've heard for many years now about the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And I read just yesterday in a little astrological uh, uh, flyer that I get that the age of Aquarius will officially astrologically begin on January 20th. So we're there. And it's kind of exciting because that's supposed to bring many new kinds of things, uh, new ideas, expansions of ideas. And for the Theosophical Society, to me, it uh, speaks to what Tim was talking about yesterday with the expansion of, of what is Theosophy and how do we, how do we um, get it out there to everybody. Okay. Uh, it is my honor pleasure to introduce to you this morning uh, Mrs. Dr. Deepapati. She is the International Vice President of the Theosophical Society. Uh, Dr. Deepapati is a retired professor of philosophy from Bhubaneswar, Odisha, who has written a book on the ethical philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. She has edited and published a compilation of articles on women's issues, Yes, She Can, in 2020, which was, uh, and was, in 2020 was published her edited book of Corona Pandemic, The Challenge and Lessons. She also writes articles on social, philosophical, theosophical, and spiritual issues for magazines and journals. Dr. Padi joined the Theosophical Society in 1994 and is presently the secretary of the Dabapi Laj Bhubaneswar. She joined the Theosophical Order of Service in 2006 and became the secretary of the Mahabharata Group, Odisha region. Its president in 2010 and in 2016, she became the president TOS Adisha. In 2017, she was elected as vice president of the International Theosophical Society. In 2013, she was invited to speak on transformational practices at the Summer National Convention of the TS in America. While there, she also attended the International Conference of the TOS. In 2016, she organized a conference on theosophical education that involved teachers and administrators from theosophical schools across India. The meeting took place in Bhubaneswar and was facilitated by Vincente Hao Chin, Jr., director of the Golden Link Theosophical College in the Philippines. I could go on for quite a long time telling you about uh, Deepa, who is my friend, as well as co-worker, sister, all of that, uh, but that we'd be here a very, very long time. So today, Deepa is here to, to talk, tell us about understanding universal intelligence. Namaste, good morning, and a very happy new year to all my brothers and sisters of our global TS family. Well, I'm going to share some of my ideas, thoughts on the topic, understanding universal intelligence. Well, have you ever watched a bird, a sparrow, or any bird making its nest? Have you ever seen a flower changing 
it's colored twice a day. Have you ever heard of a cow caressing a tiger cub? Have you ever been enamored by the colorful rainbows in the sky that uh, looks like a designer's masterpiece? All this mean that there is an intelligent principle working behind the universe and that it exists for a reason, for a particular reason. The creation is not mechanical or coincidental, it is teleological. Well, before we focus on universal intelligence, we need to understand what is universal consciousness, first of all. Uh, universal consciousness is not the pure consciousness which, uh, you know, which we call absolute reality. And uh, in Vedanta they say Brahman. Actually, when we say Brahman, it means the absolute reality, the pure consciousness. And uh, the Vedantic, uh, that is the, it is, uh, when it is manifested, when this absolute consciousness is manifested, it is called universal consciousness. It is the real perceiver of all things and beings. The universal consciousness when manifested becomes the real perceiver of all things and beings. Universal consciousness is the prerequisite of universal intelligence. If there is no universal consciousness, there, is, there cannot be universal intelligence. Because intelligence can work only through consciousness. Universal intelligence is sometimes confused with human limited intelligence also. If we go back to history, we find Aristotle had defined intelligence as a means of, uh, I mean for achieving and executing power. In 17th century, René Descartes, a French philosopher, perceived it in a different way. He would say only human beings possess the consciousness uh, to reason on their own, own selves and the world around, as only humans have this property of consciousness, which plants and other animals do not have. That is self-consciousness. His famous statement, we are all aware of, is cogito ergozum, which means I think, therefore I am. My existence is dependent on my thinking. Man is a thinking being, therefore he is superior to all other creatures. That was the view of René Descartes. In 18th century, Immanuel Kant had made a statement that, and I'm quoting, some people are rulers and some people are slaves. Intelligence is the difference between them. In 
In 19th century, it was thought that an artificial model can be made to hold intelligence like in uh, mechanized instruments and engines. In 20th century, we are seeing how intelligence can be stored in the machines for use in future. In 21st century, we have found artificial intelligence, the models of which we find in cars uh, without drivers, the Google cars, you know, these days, machines doing all sorts of work of human beings in every sphere of human actions. These days, now, we are talking of different types of intelligence, like intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, artificial intelligence, and innate intelligence as well. Uh, Intellectual intelligence is used in measuring analytical skills and cognitive abilities and many other scientific analysis. Emotional intelligence is said to be expressed through our ability to manage and also understand our emotions and that of others as well. Spiritual intelligence is a much higher dimension of intelligence beyond our ego, beyond I-ness, in the form of various virtues like love, wisdom, compassion, empathy, happiness, and peace. Through spiritual intelligence, one realizes the true meaning and purpose of life. In fact, the aim of spiritual intelligence is to strengthen interpersonal relationship and to bring about transformation of the individual from the fragmentation to integration, from the diversity to unity. Artificial intelligence. But I find a contradiction in it. How can intelligence be artificial? Isn't it odd? Doesn't it sound a little bit odd? The recent invention of Google cards or the cards without driver is much talked about subject. Actually, when I was in California in July, I had an opportunity to sit in that car. But <laughs> I, you know, I just, uh, didn't avail that opportunity because I felt very unsafe. <laughs> when actually when human being drives a car, he has the conscious feelings, you know, but the car without a driver doesn't have consciousness of its own. So it is run by the human intelligence and human intelligence is uh, liable to, subject to error, as human minds are. So I felt a little diffident about that. In Bhagavad Gita, it is said, intelligence is said to be mind's instructor, but not its instrument. I'm repeating, in Bhagavad Gita, it is said, Intelligence is said to be mind's instructor, but not its instrument. Artificial intelligence can be considered as an instrument of human intellect, but not intelligence. Then innate intelligence. Innate intelligence is understood as the inherent power of matter, which is a piece of universal intelligence. In the words of R.W. Stephenson, the force 
which the force which universal intelligence gives to organic matter as a higher order of its manifestations is called innate intelligence. I'm repeating the force which universal intelligence gives to organic matter as a higher order of its manifestations is called innate intelligence. So all these types of intelligence, including human intelligence, are nothing but different manifestations of universal intelligence. In the seventh chapter, uh, in the seventh chapter, fourth and fifth verses of Gita, it is said, O mighty armed Ar Arjuna, there is a superior energy of mind which comprises all the living entities who are interacting with the material nature and are sustaining the universe. This means universal intelligence is in all matter and constantly gives to it all its qualities and actions. In short, whatever is existent possesses universal intelligence. According to theosophy, there is nothing called inner granuk or without consciousness and intelligence in the universe. One finds in the universal prayer, O oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom, O oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. Here, life is consciousness, which is possessed by every atom, and light is referred to as intelligence, which is possessed by every creature. But now, scientists have uh, demonstrated that uh, plants can also perceive the world in their own way. I'm quoting a scientist. A plant may not have eyes, but it perceives light through photoreceptor proteins that cover its entire body and that are nearly identical to the ones inside our own retinas. It is as if the plant had tiny eyes all over its body. A plant knows if you are standing next to it and in which color dress you are wearing, a red or green or white. Even a blade of grass sees the world around it, makes a decision and acts accordingly. Because of this reason, some philosophers have granted personhood to plants Recent scientific research has just proved that small invertebrates like bees can think and handle abstract concepts. Many other species of certain system of communication, some of which are comparable with human language. Therefore, intelligence is not restricted only to human beings and animals. Universal intelligence exists in every organic as well as in inorganic matter. But the degree of intelligence varies from one form to another form of existence. As uh, Arthur Young says, consciousness lives in minerals, wakes up in plants, walks in animals, and thinks in human beings. It is true of the universal intelligence also. Therefore, it is not that the intelligence is possessed by only by human beings because they are supposed to be the highest creation having self-consciousness. Because again, intelligence is not possessed equally by all human beings. It is said again in Bhagavad Gita that though all 
pervading power of our intelligence is manifested in multifarious things, it is found to be more powerful in some than others, be it living or non-living. Lord Krishna, the symbol of universal consciousness and intelligence, is said to be Vrigu, Vrigu among all rishis, among immovable things, the Himalaya, among warriors, Shiram, and among rivers, Ganges, and the list goes on, of course. Human intelligence is but one manifestation of universal intelligence. The more we become aware of universal intelligence and get connected to it, more wisdom will be unfolded for working in this world. Examples can be found in case of the scientists who come out with new inventions and discoveries. In fact, in order to be more clear about universal intelligence, one needs to refer to Sankhya theory of evolution in Indian philosophy. This theory of evolution is the basis of other theories of evolution. This is very, I mean, this is the base. This is supposed to be the base. Even in Bhagavad Gita, one finds references uh, uh, from uh, Sankhya theory of evolution. In Sankhya uh, philosophy, there are two important concepts, uh, Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha, that is the pure consciousness, Prakriti, the primordial material principle. It is a state, uh, uh, yes, Purusha is a Sanskrit word, I hope you all know, Sanskrit word for pure consciousness, and Prakriti is primordial matter. It is a state, Prakriti is a state in which Sattva, Raja, and Tamas these three gunas are in a homogeneous state. When the state of homogeneity gets disturbed by the presence of purusha, of pure consciousness, evolution takes place. Purusha is the witnessing consciousness which illuminates all consciousness but is unaffected by the changes in gunas of prakriti and remains separate from the material world. Self-realization is attained when this distinction is realized and one gets detached from the cycles of prakriti, the material, the primordial principle, or you can call it material world. The first evolute is called Mahat. The first evolute which comes out of this tree is called, these two, it's called Mahat. Mahat meaning great. Sattva predominates in this evolute. Being evolute of pure consciousness, Mahat is universal consciousness and also the universal intelligence as it contains the essence of all manifestations. So, so Mahat, Mahat has both universal consciousness and also universal intelligence. It is the first evolute. It can be said uh, to be the tangential point. Actually, it is the tangential point between unmanifest and manifest. When it is manifested in the material planet, uh, plane, sorry, 
it is called universal intelligence it is purely sattvic it is also called buddhi buddhi from mahat evolves ahankara or ego which means self identity from sattvic ahankara this ahankara from sattvic ahankara hmm come uh, come out ma- manas and uh, yes manas and the f- uh, five karmendriyas sense organs gyanendriyas five gyanendriyas five karmendriyas and organs of action then tamas tamas ahankara from tamas ahankara five tanmatras or subtle essences and five mahabhutas uh, which are known as the elements come out in uh, all these evolutes one finds the trace of universal intelligence though in different degrees in theosophy mahat is called universal mind or the cosmic ideation it is the universal intelligence which is not eternal because it is limited by the duration by Man- manvantara whereas universal consciousness is eternal universal consciousness is eternal but universal intelligence is not eternal the math is used in various uh, theosophical context it refers to cosmic principle of intelligence the third logos the universal mind which transforms disharmony into harmony chaos into order and through it the material world through uh, yes it is also known as cosmic ideation some consider it as an a priori principle also in uh, secret doctrine madam levatsky had expressed the idea and i quote cosmic mind is mahat divine ideation in active creative operation cosmic ideation is equated with mahabuddhi and mahat it is also the third manifested logos according to j krishnamurti people of religious feelings instead of using the word intelligence have used the word god uh, even david bohm the quantum physicist was of the opinion that god is perhaps a metaphor for intelligence god means that which is immeasurable beyond thought i'm quoting from the dialogue with j krishnamurti and bohm the desire for this intelligence through time has created this image of god jesus krishna 
or whatever it is, by having faith in that which is still the movement of thought, one hopes that there will be harmony in one's life. Even Aitariya Upanishad maintains that everything in the universe is guided by this universal intelligence, supported by this intelligence, and established in this intelligence also. But universal intelligence, or God, is not the ultimate or absolute truth. Absolute truth is, that is, the pure consciousness is unmanifested. Pure consciousness, we have already discussed about that, that it is, it is not manifested consciousness, it is not universal consciousness, it is pure, unmanifested consciousness. Human beings are highly intelligent as they are able to produce artificial intelligence. Only human beings can understand and experience the universal intelligence as they have a developed consciousness known as self-consciousness, which no other creations have. Our conscious mind is in communication with our subconscious mind that knows what to do. It means the universe is always connected and in communication with our subconscious mind, the universe senses informations constantly, but because of our restless and adulterated mind and the limited capacity of our brain, we don't understand the meaning of it. Within us is the spark of universal intelligence as the innate intelligence. But we are not aware, again, we are not aware of it. One needs to go within to be in constant touch with the universal intelligence through practice of meditation or focusing the mind on what we want. We don't have to depend on the outer world at all. Whatever you want can be achieved through our intense thought, whether it is material or spiritual. Miracles can be explained by the universal intelligence as they are nothing but manifestations of thoughts through universal intelligence, of which most people are not aware of. Nikola Tesla, an American physicist and inventor says, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. This sounds more rational and scientific because we get connected to the universe, universal intelligence through energy, frequency, and vibration. So by, by going within, with constant practice of meditation and being aware of the informations of universal intelligence, a stage will come when we can realize that within us is the universal intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Very interesting and erudite talk. Okay, our next speaker is Stephen McDonald. Uh, Mr. McDonald is the national president of the TS in Australia. He has been an active member of the Theosophical Society since 1976. He is past president of Blavatsky Lodge, Sydney, 
and is currently the national president of the TS in Australia. He has had an enduring interest in the work of J. Krishnamurti and theosophical classics such as The Voice of the Silence and Light on the Path. For many years, Stephen ran a private clinic as a homeopath and later became a lecturer at the person that he treated. Dr. Banerjee was trained, as I said, in pure science and he understood biology and he understood life in that very holistic way. He was a keen observer and one of his observations was that the earliest living creatures, such as the amoeba and protozoa, had no brain and yet they possessed some sort of intelligence to coordinate the functions necessary to sustain life. Unicellular organisms are thought to be the oldest form of life on Earth, with early protocells possibly emerging from about 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. Unicellular creatures such as amoeba and primitive protozoa would eat, digest, excrete and reproduce. That is, they needed no brain to survive and to flourish. Reflecting on these earliest forms of life, the amoeba and protozoa must, uh, must prompt a fundamental question. What is this innate intelligence that orchestrates the functions necessary for life itself? An innate intelligence governed by metabolism without a thinking brain. So I propose that the term we use for the thoughts and reactions generated by the brain would better be described as intellect rather than intelligence. And I think Dr. Deepa Padi alluded to this as well. When I use the term universal intelligence, however, I mean that kind of intelligence which is an innate principle in all life. In fact, it may be viewed as an occult law that permeates all creation, just like the law of karma or the law of eternal cycles. To provide some context, I'd like to give you a quick summary of some of the main ideas revealed in theosophical teachings about this term universal intelligence. H.P. Blavatsky elucidates the idea of universal intelligence in her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, which we're all familiar with, of course. In fact, the concept of universal intelligence is woven throughout the secret doctrine. This intelligence is the primordial, eternal principle that pervades the whole cosmos. She says it manifests itself as a universal mind. Blavatsky proposed that the existence of this universal mind is seen as the source of all intelligence and the source of all consciousness. It is the cosmic intelligence that underlies and connects all manifestations in the universe. Another person who Dr. Deepa Padi mentioned was David Bohm, of course. Uh, and in recent times, you may be aware, I don't know, that David Bohm has had a renaissance, one might say, because of a documentary that was made about his life and um, extraordinary uh, documentary and about an extraordinary man. Those of you who don't know him, he was a theoretical physicist and he attempted uh, to describe um, this fact of cosmic intelligence underlying and connecting everything in the universe when he postulated an implicate order. 
which is a field that underpins the whole of reality. This implicate order is a theoretical framework that Bohm developed to describe a deeper, more fundamental level of reality underlying the apparent order of the everyday world. In the implicate order, everything is interconnected and enfolded within an undivided wholeness. So here we have a physicist who's trying to give some kind of theoretical framework to understand what all this is, because at the end of the day, do any of us understand what we're talking about when we say universal intelligence? I mean, I, I don't. I don't think anyone that I know really has a real grasp of what they're talking about. It's something very, very profound. I mean, we are talking about the ultimate source of all existence and the driving force behind the evolution of the universe. Some may call it God, but I think that term is too limiting in its scope. It is a term, though, that many of us are familiar with from our youngest age. Blavatsky posits the idea of one life and one law as fundamental aspects of universal intelligence. The interconnectedness of all life and the adherence to a universal law govern the workings of the cosmos. She also emphasises the universal truths present in all of the major religions and wisdom traditions. The esoteric core of these traditions reflects the unity of universal intelligence and understanding this unity is crucial for our spiritual growth. Also, the concept of reincarnation and karma are integral to Blavatsky's understanding of universal intelligence. Intelligence in evolves over successive lifetimes and individuals undergo experiences to learn and progress spiritually. Madame Blavatsky describes the cyclical evolution of humanity through different root races, each characterised by distinct levels of intelligence and spiritual development. This evolutionary journey involves the development and refinement of human intelligence across these cycles. Universal intelligence encompasses esoteric knowledge and wisdom that is accessible to those who seek spiritual understanding beyond conventional exoteric teachings. True intelligence involves tapping into this hidden wisdom and transcending superficial external knowledge. More recently, these ideas were integrated into a modern framework for understanding the connection of intelligence as a fundamental principle of the universe. In his book, Intelligence Came First, E. Lester Smith gave a survey of the primacy of intelligence. Ernest Lester Smith was an eminent scientist, a fellow of the Royal Society and a member of the Theosophical Society for, I think, most of his life or many years of his life. Smith proposes that intelligence is not a product of biological evolution, but an inherent quality of the cosmos itself. He argues for a conscious universe where intelligence is a fundamental property that precedes the emergence of living organisms. Rather like uh, the ideas that my mentor has about intelligence, I think. And he challenges the conventional view that intelligence is a product of evolution and instead he posits that evolution is a manifestation of pre-existing intelligence. So this is the idea that intelligence came first before everything else did in the universe and certainly before all life did. Smith discusses how life and consciousness emerge as expressions of the underlying cosmic intelligence rather than accidental outcomes of evolutionary processes. 
This is not to be confused with, what is it called? Intelligent design or whatever, in a way, that a lot of the, um, a lot of the fundamentalists tend to kind of talk about, uh, which is not at all supported by any scientific reality. You know, the idea that the Earth was about 7,000 years old and everything that we see in scientific literature is really just a creation, um, uh, a fantasy, not to be concerned, uh, not to be confused with that idea. Uh, Smith emphasises the interconnectedness of all things in the universe, suggesting that intelligence forms the basis for the unity and coherence observed in the cosmos. In a similar way to Blavatsky, Smith posits the idea that there is a cosmic blueprint or order governed by intelligence that shapes the unfolding of the universe. Some traditions view cosmic design as an interconnected web of existence where every element is intricately linked and contributes to the overall harmony of the cosmos. This perspective often emphasises the interdependence of all things and the idea that everything has a place and purpose within the larger design. I would now like to return to a further discussion about the ideas of the action of intelligence in simple forms of life. So I just put that in perspective that what we're talking about when we talk about universal intelligence, we're not talking about the idea of intelligence as it's often common thought, commonly thought to be. It was interesting because when we were at the General Council meeting and we decided or, or approved of the theme for this uh, convention as universal intelligence, there was a bit of, um, you know, misunderstanding, I think, about what intelligence was being talked about and when they understood, OK, you're talking about, yes, universal intelligence, we're talking about something much deeper and much more profound uh, than we are when we talk about uh, human intellect. So, as I mentioned earlier, the amoeba is a primitive unit of life working independently from other units of life. As the evolution of life progressed, there came multicellular organisms, for example, the sponge. Sponges are simple aquatic animals that represent one of the earliest forms of multicellular life on Earth. Sponges have a simple body structure with no true tissues or organs. They are characterised by a porous body made up of a gelatinous matrix called mesohyle, which surrounds a system of canals and chambers. By the way, the sponge is underneath the, the sea urchin that's attached itself to it with all the spikes on, of course, is not the sponge. And sponges exhibit remarkable regenerative capabilities. If a sponge is fragmented, each piece has the potential to regenerate into a new functional sponge. Their simplicity and lack of true tissues distinguishes them from more complex animals, making them crucial in understanding the evolutionary transition from unicellular to multicellular life. So the single cells aggregate together to form more complex structures and more complex organisms. Similarly, in more complex life forms, Organs in a body arise out of the aggregation of specialised single cells. In animal bodies, organs aggregate to form systems such as the digestive or cardiovascular system. Notably, each organ and system operates then independently and interdependently to maintain life and physiology as a whole. We know that only so many parts can be removed from the organism and life will cease to exist. Some parts can be removed, for example, the gallbladder 
can be removed and a person's life goes on uh, quite uh, relatively uninterrupted. The spleen can be removed in the same way. Portions of the liver can be removed. And, of course, we know the appendix can be removed. And it is no disparage disparagement to uh, life. But some parts cannot be removed. The brain, it's rather difficult to remove the brain, uh, the heart or the stomach, and for a person to live on. In fact, it's impossible. My mentor, Dr Banerjee, postulated that each of the organs in the body operates on a mental and physical plane of activity. He came to believe that every organ has its own type of identity and operates with its own consciousness and its own purpose. Interestingly, each organ makes its own physical contribution and its own mental contribution to the organism as a whole. He observed that some organs make a greater mental contribution than others. For example, the brain, which is a specialised organ of thinking, according to him, contributes far more to the mental-emotional condition of the organism than, say, the kidneys, for example. We now know that a greater level of mental activity is going on in the gut than previously thought. There is an emerging understanding of what is sometimes described as the gut-brain connection, where the gastrointestinal system communicates bidirectionally with the central nervous system, influencing mental and emotional well-being. The gut is sometimes colloquially referred to as the second brain, I loved that idea when I first encountered it when I was studying health science. Um, I, I thought that that was a very, a very interesting way to describe it, a second brain of the body. Um, and this is due to its role in influencing particularly emotional responses and intuition in the body. Uh, it has a much more important part to play than people ever imagined. And this is only the tip of the iceberg of research that's going on when we look at uh, the relationship between the condition of the gastrointestinal tract and the emotional lability of people. Hello, friend. What are you doing? <laughs> Taking a look. Um, OK, so people often describe, we know gut feelings, and they often say, oh, but they had butterflies in the stomach. And in relation, to emotional in relation to emotional experiences that they've had, we've all felt it sometime. But ongoing research, research continues to explore the intricacies of the gut-brain connection. The, the field holds promise for novel therapeutic approaches to mental health problems, to issues related to overall well-being of the person as well. And there is ongoing research into the nexus between the brain and the heart. It seems that thinking is not a one-way activity, but that the heart contributes far more to the emotional well-being of a person than we previously imagined. The idea that heart transplant recipients might take on characteristic of their donors is still regarded by the mainstream medical community to be lacking in enough evidence to make any conclusions. But the concept is often called cellular memory or organ memory, and it, what it suggests is that the organ recipient may inherit some traits, even memories or characteristics from the organ donor. The scientific uh, consensus is that me memories and traits are primarily associated with the brain and the nervous system not with individual cells or organs. Scientific investigations have not provided conclusive evidence to support the existence of cellular memory in the context of organ transplantation. However, it's important to note that the majority of research in the field of transplantation has focused on medical outcomes, um, organ uh, compatibility, rejection mechanisms and improving patient well-being rather than on the transfer of memories or, 
or uh, any uh, traits of the person. Uh, naturally, that would be the case. Um, but there have been case examples of characteristics of very specific skills being developed, such as sporting prowess by a recipient who previously had no ability in the field. So there's some quite interesting uh, things that have been observed and need to be investigated, and I'm not claiming that these things uh, actually have the kind of evidence behind them that would convince uh, the, the conventional scientific community. But it's certainly an area that needs more research. And in fact, this whole thing, which is now very well demonstrated about the brain-gut connection, if you went back about 15 years, you would have been told by anyone in the medical community, it, it, it's nonsense. There's no good evidence. There's now very good evidence, in fact, um, about that connection. So we may see things change, of course, in the future. I mean, designing robust studies to build a body of evidence to support the concept of cellular memory is going to be difficult um, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. And funding for such research is quite limited, really. Nevertheless, this field is being studied by some within the medical profession who have had extensive experience with transplant recipients. The important point is that from the view of occult science, intelligence is implicit in every cell and in all of life. It underpins the efficient operation of all the functions to sustain life. Now, to the point of this talk, in a sense, and this is what I will be finishing up with you, uh, um, the point I'll be finishing up with you on. How do we apply this knowledge in our everyday lives? So what is the point in us understanding this? Understanding the innate intelligence governing all life has profound implications for human health and well-being. Ah, for other animals as well as humans, but um, as humans it's always our concern, isn't it? Um, understanding the innate intelligence that controls all life has implications in our understanding of disease and what creates health and well-being. The World Health Organisation defines health as a state of complete physical mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So it's actually a much more broad, it's a holistic viewpoint of human health to look at it from that perspective. This comprehensive definition reflects this holistic understanding of health, and it goes beyond the traditional biomedical model taking into account various factors that contribute to an individual's overall well-being. I propose to you that an understanding of universal intelligence should guide us toward a holistic perspective on healthcare, for example. This is only one example that I'm giving you. Evidence reveals that health and well-being rely on many economic, social, environmental and other determinants. I suggest that they also rely on an understanding of this innate intelligence and an attempt to maintain harmony with this principle that underpins all life and, in fact, all creation. Many spiritual traditions emphasise the interconnectedness of mind and body. We know that. Practices such as meditation or mindfulness even prayer, which are often associated with spiritual pursuits, have been linked to positive effects on physical health. These practices may reduce stress, improve immune function and contribute to overall well-being. There's plenty of solid evidence to support those conclusions. Some spiritual traditions also emphasise a holistic approach to health, considering the interconnectedness of the physical, mental, emotional and spiritual aspects of a person as vital to the maintenance of their health 
as much as any kind of medical interventions are. This holistic perspective may encourage individuals to, do, to adopt healthier lifestyle choices, including balanced nutrition, regular exercise and adequate rest. This does not, of course, mean substituting good health care for meditation alone, but it's all part of one picture. And if we're going to really take a truly intelligent approach to life, we should say it's part of the one picture uh, to be involved in those things as well as any other medical interventions. It means integrating an understanding of the universal principles into the practice of modern healthcare. So these universal principles that we're talking about at this convention have a very practical application in modern healthcare. I propose that rather than practicing medicine from a purely biomedical perspective, an understanding of the underlying nature of universal intelligence must, must shift our perspective from a mechanistic one to a holistic one. This means expanding a reductionistic view of healthcare to embrace a holistic understanding that integrates the wisdom of ancient traditions with modern medical practices. It's a, a tough ask, and it's a tough ask for someone who's spent years at a university being basically brainwashed into one perspective, a reductionistic perspective on life. Uh, and I'm not saying all of the medical profession has done that. Many, many fine doctors have looked at life in a very broad way, and I've met many of them, and I have great admiration for them. And I understand what happens, though. We've all been through it, haven't we, at uh, colleges, at universities, etc., where we've been basically brainwashed into a particular framework into a particular paradigm, but that paradigm is not the only paradigm. We don't want to restrict ourselves. I mean, if you have any doubts about what I'm proposing, I suggest you read the decisive evidence about models for the management of chronic health conditions, such as that developed the most famous model for managing chronic health conditions is one by uh, Ed Wagner and colleagues Wagner's chronic care model, the CCM, emphasises a totally holistic way of treatment which achieves far better outcomes for patient care. There's no doubt about it. Um, and it wasn't actually until I went to the source and read what Wagner himself said about the chronic care model that I really understood what he was talking about and I really understood the implications that it has for health care. So that's all I've got to talk to you about today. Um, I really do hope that we can take away from this convention something that is practical, just a, a, just a, a part of something that's practical, that we can, uh, we can either reinterpret aspects of what we understand in life or that we can actually apply in some way. Um, and so I'll leave that with you. Thank you for allowing me to share some of those ideas with you today. Ah, how wonderful. It's exactly 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Done my best to keep to the time. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Mm. So thank you, Stephen. That was really, really interesting. I don't know if Shakar has any announcements or anything before we leave. Is he around? Doesn't look like it. OK. So the next thing on the agenda is the Indian Section Convention, part one. And so those of us who are not involved in that are free until the next thing after that, which is lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a very good day.